Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens. As Cindy mentioned, my name is James Gagliardi. I'm a supervisory horticulturist here at Smithsonian Gardens. I oversee the gardens around the Freer, Castle, Help Garden, Rose Garden, and Ripley Garden. Uh, lifelong gardener, love to be outdoors even in the winter. And really today we're gonna to be talking about finding that extra beauty. So our topic for this today is beautiful winter gardens. So that's really an aesthetic thing. So how you're gonna find beauty. And I hope to share some things with you that you're gonna say, of course, I would always see that as beautiful. And in some ways, change your mind into seeing the beauty when we move out of the summer season, out of the fall season, and go into that quieter winter season to find those little tones, those little special moments that you have in the garden and figure out how to enjoy them a little bit more. Uh, I try to be a great presenter, so I gave a plant list and I believe the link was provided in the chat there. It's also gonna be up on our website. So everything you see, every plant we talk about today uh, is on that four page list that's available to you. It's gonna have the common name, the Latin name, and I put an extra tag there if it's native. We have a national audience, so native in this respect is native to the US somewhere within it. Uh, additionally, I try to be nice to you, so on all the slides when we're talking about a plant, the Latin and common name are gonna be up there too. So you can take good notes and hopefully learn a lot. So the outline of our talk today, as I said, we're gonna try to change your mind or just tweak it a little bit on the beauty that we find in our gardens during the winter season. And we'll start by talking about the few basics of design, color, size and texture, structure, and care and pruning, and how all those feed into a great aesthetic within our garden. And then we're gonna look at plant recommendations. Uh, particularly different types of plants or things that you want to draw into the garden. So the list may not be exactly what you want to bring in, but it's going to open your mind into different ideas. So color. The winter garden doesn't just have to be gray and dark. And there's ways to design with color. Looking at the color wheel here, you can do complementary, you can do uh, the colors that are across from each other, next to each other, and those could be a more design way. You can also put in any color you want, but just because it's winter doesn't mean that you don't get the options of different colors. So here on the screen here, you see that on the color chart, the blue violet is complete opposite of the yellow orange. And those two colors together look really nice together. So here's just a little sampling. If you wanted to create a blue violet and gold orange garden in winter, that's something that if you do the right research and you find the right plants, you'll be able to get that aesthetic into your garden. And we wanna think about how we're presenting those colors too. So we're gonna look at some different elements that we're gonna bring in. But here is a uh, Ilex verticillata, a sparkleberry, um, and it's a deciduous holly. So those red berries, if they have a good backdrop to them, so on the side of the screen with the green backdrop, it really makes those berries and those fruits pop a lot more than you would see if you put it up, let's say against your red brick house. So you wanna think about how you're using those colors and how they're gonna present in the winter season. The same thing here with this coral bark maple. Um, up against our Smithsonian castle that has that dark stone, they're almost the same color. So that, pit, that first picture, it's pretty much washing it out. But when you have that holly in the back of it, you can really see that plant light up, glow, and fill in that area. Size and texture are also a great consideration for how you're designing at any time, and particularly in the winter. So you want to think about the use of bold leaves and the use of light and airy things. So the first shot that has the grass in the foreground, you're able to look through that to see the depth of the garden and your eye moves back to that kale plant with the purple leaf. On the other side, the big bold leaf, a rock, something large is going to stop your eye and you're not going to see through the entire area of the garden so that 
cabbage plant in the front really becomes dominant in that landscape and you're not seeing uh, the dill that's growing behind it there. You want to think about the structure and particularly the winter structure that plants are bringing. So that first Japanese maple has that cool twist to it, um, something that you're not going to notice in the summertime when the leaves are out, but when winter comes, you're going to get that great structure and that look out of it. Where on the other side, evergreens are going to add a consistent structure in the garden, and the winter is going to be the time where maybe they're able to pop more out of a perennial border where everything else has gone dormant for the season. In care and pruning, that first shot, that's when I tended to the pollinator garden at the Natural History Museum. I think that's beautiful. I'm gonna teach you a little bit more about finding the beauty in depth. The second shot is the topiary garden at Longwood Gardens. Both of them have a particular method for the care and pruning. Both have a reason why they look so good. Um, and we'll find out how to work with those two different styles. So as I said, the majority of what we're talking about is plants and how to use different plant elements to draw these elements into your garden. So we're going to run through a various list. We're going to talk about bringing in berries, bringing in different grasses, an appreciation of seed heads, the use of stem and bark to bring in color and texture, evergreens, and then we'll even talk about some flowers, including some annuals that you can bring in to really give that extra punch to your garden if you don't quite have the color or appearance that you're hoping for. So here is the garden at um, the pollinator garden at the Natural History Museum. In summer, in full bloom, that mother and child enjoying the garden, really full of activity. And as that fades away and we move into the winter, into the fall, there's still a lot of color. There's a lot of texture in there. Different elements come alive that you wouldn't have seen in that first shot. And some of you are gonna think it's a stretch, but it's really about finding the beauty in the depth of the plant or the dormancy of the plant to look at those unique structures, to look at those unique colors, to look at the activity going on that you're not gonna recognize in a full garden. Uh, here's that same garden deep in the winter where we're starting to get a little bit of snow. That family turned in and they took their picture. They wanted to walk into the museum to see the Hope Diamond, to see our T-Rex, but they stopped in the garden and took a picture. And why did they do that? It was because of the beautiful setting that this garden created in winter. And a lot of that has to do with leaving the dormant plants up. So they're catching the snow, they're bringing that elegance in and making it a wonderful spot to stick your tongue out and catch snowflakes. So the first conversation we're going to have is about berries, a very fun element to bring into the garden. It's also a good food source for a lot of birds. You want to think about the life cycle of how a berry comes about, which is that we're going to have pollination when there's a flower going, and then there's gonna be that fruit. And hopefully, and especially with a lot of our native fruits, those eventually become the food source for birds. And in thinking about that, we're gonna to wanna to consider what the life cycle of that fruit is on the plant. So this is again in the pollinator garden at Natural History and that top shot, you see this cat bird was giving me the eye, sort of staring me down. And then he turned and he took the fruit off of the spice bush there, our native Lindera. That fruit is supposed to turn red and be there in the winter, but that bird was so ready to eat it that it's gone by the time that we get into the winter season, that it's such a good food source. So that's really not a fruit that we're going to consider to add to our winter garden. Um, also, I want to mention when talking about this plant is we need to consider what the plant's doing and once again going back to that life cycle. So something like Lindera or a lot of the hollies we're talking about, you're going to need to have a male and a female plant. So obviously our bird friend here is hanging out in the female because she's bearing fruit, but right across the pathway from it is the male 
that that pollen's going to spread using a vector, using a pollinator, so that those fruits can be born. But if we don't have the non-fruiting uh, plant, we're not going to have the one that gets us those berries in the season. Uh, so here we look at a different thing, the American holly. And I know we'll get that season, it's going to be a little bit later through the winter season where here in DC we'll have these big flocks of the robins that just come and steal, all, steal eat, use um, all of the fruit just in one fall swoop, they'll come through. But for a long season up until then, we'll get to enjoy um, the berries that are produced on there. We want to think about how those plants interact. So I mentioned this a little bit at the beginning of the talk, but on the top there we have our American holly. That's going to be an evergreen holly, so we're always going to have the look that it shows right now with those green leaves and the red fruit playing together. While in the lower left-hand corner, the Ilex verticillata, um, incorrectly named American holly on my little sheet right there, uh, is going to be the deciduous holly. And that is going to drop those green leaves. And then we're going to have these barren sticks with the fruit on it. So we want to think about how these different elements are going to play in our landscape and how they're going to progress through the season, what the colors are going to continue to be, what leaves will be there, what leaves won't be there, and what fruit may dis disappear a little bit quicker than something else. Um, as I said, we want to look at that positioning. So here's a hybrid holly, Ilex sparkleberry, bred by the National Arboretum close up the road from us here. Uh, very densely fruited. It looks great. And when we position it up against that evergreen shrub behind it, it really pops in the landscape. And then we just add that element of snow and here you're really getting that classic winter look. Something that when we need to escape out a little bit and walk through the garden, this is the vignette we hope to see. Or maybe this is the vignette that's most important for us to position near the window because we know that we're gonna be hunkered down in the heat by the fireplace and we wanna look out our window and see what's going on in the garden even if we don't wanna be in it. So think about creating this vignette where you're gonna see it, where you're gonna enjoy it during the winter season. Because maybe we don't wanna go out and shovel a pathway through the snow and maybe our boots aren't quite high enough for those of you that are getting the large snow in the pole. We can also consider color here. So here, went out there for a quick moment. I think I'm back. If I'm not, tell me about it. Uh, so here is another garden, uh, a, another ilex. This is called winter gold, so it has that orange color. You can see it really popping here against the snow, but think about the setup. Think about how those colors you want to use and what's going to look best in your landscape. And look beyond what might be the normal or the average red berry. Um, so talking about that further, we can get things like purple berries. So this is the American beauty berry, our native beauty berry. There is also Asian varieties, uh, Calicarpa americana. Uh, this picture I took during the summertime, you can see the pollinator there uh, getting those fruits ready. So the bloom right before that pink blossom is showing where those berries are setting up. And then after that, you see the buds that are yet to open. So we have this progression going on in the summer of these flowers happening, of these berries being set. And now this time of year, we're going to see these fruits being formed. And if I go out in the garden now, I can see that purple color just beginning to come on, some still green. So we have this gradient going through. And then we're gonna to move towards a time when the leaves drop. And then we just have the barren stems adding this great purple color. And then the birds do get a little bit excited about these uh, slightly earlier in the season, so they may get eaten away. And that's a good thing. We want to contribute back to the wildlife that we have in the garden. It doesn't always have to be strong color, too. It could just be about how the berries play. So here's our native uh, eastern red cedar. I chose this cultivar to go in the garden called Canteri because I saw it was for our bird garden and it's the most heavily fruited. 
So it is uh, cedar, a red cedar that I noticed where the public, where visitors that I have, they actually do notice the fruit on them and they'll point it out, they'll want to talk about it, which I don't see as much with other cedars. So getting this particular cultivar was definitely a win there. And then once again, it will contribute back to the habitat. And perhaps you're making gin at home or you're trying to look for new hobbies during this pandemic so you can learn how to turn those fruits into a nice gin drink for yourself. We want to think about the joy that these plants are going to give us in the fall season. So some may just come into a feature during the winter, but others are going to have a much grander, beautiful life cycle. So here is a crab apple that's blooming in the urban bird habitat garden at the Natural History Museum. We get this beautiful spring white flowered bloom on it. it happens just after the cherry blossoms. And everybody thinks it's a cherry tree at that point, but we easily tell them the signage is on it to teach them that it's a crab apple. And then you can see that unlike the cherry trees that we have here around the tidal basin, which are not fruit bearing, just used for the flowers, these will give a fruit. And now that winter, that fall look with those grasses rising up, with this coverage of the fruits on it really adds an extra element and keeps that looking good during multiple seasons for us. Uh, one of my favorite plants in the garden are red chokeberry, a great native, uh, has fantastic fall color on it, a great white flower in the spring, um, and wonderful, wonderful fruit set. It was the opening slide for my berry talk. Uh, but the unique thing about this plant too is it takes a strong cold treatment for the fruits to become palatable. They're very astringent. So it's not something that the birds are gonna go right for. If they try to eat any that are set on that shrub right now, they're not gonna like them. They're not gonna want them. They also have a little bit lower of a nutritional value. So they are not the peak interest for birds, yet they do play an important role for birds in our native habitat because it takes so long for that cold treatment to actually make them edible and they last till the end of the season, for an area that may get a deep snow, let's say there's a foot of snow on the ground late in January, February, and that there's not a lot of other food sources available, the ground's covered up, you can't get to seeds, uh, the other berries have already been eaten, these are gonna be the last fruits in town and they're gonna be the ones that want that finally get eaten and are supplying that food source when it's desperately needed in a blizzard. The next topic we're going to look at is grasses. Sort of looking at the beauty once again of when these grasses dry out, the texture they add. Uh, here in this image you can see the way that they're going to catch the light, that they're going to catch the snow, the movement in it. We want to, I want to get you to believe in this elegance in winter and enjoy a scene like this that can get set up in your garden. Um, another great feature too is those grasses like many things are going to add for an element uh, for habitat. So once you get into the spring season and that nest building comes along, very important, very comfortable material for our friendly birds to build nests out of. So of course you put in a wonderful grass and the crowds are going to come around. They're going to enjoy it. They're going to love it. Uh, look at these uh, visitors to us on the National Mall just flocking around this great grass. That's not what they're looking at. They're looking Below there, the beautiful lantana was covered in butterflies and they're there inspecting it. But the grass does have its moment. So when those annual flowers are gone and it's beginning to crown above this uh, panicum uh, cultivar called cloud nine, which is particularly open and airy, gets this great gold color. It's gonna add a lot of element in. It's brighter than some of the other elements we have in the garden. And then it will catch those frost drops, those dew drops. So you're gonna have to go out constantly and inspect these dried grasses or other things to see when the light's catching it perfectly, to see it on those dewy mornings and enjoy that landscape. Uh, here's a beautiful fall strip that we have on 12th Street up against the Natural History Museum that I designed. And you can see those grass elements in the fall adding to the color in there. 
that is our Mullenbergia. So this grass was something that really stops the crowds in the fall. They love to touch it. They love to uh, really interact with it and engage with it. In our area here, it becomes a little bit marginal. So it does have the potential to dip away uh, and not survive for the long period. You may not see it 10 years out, um, but we have had some success with keeping them around. Uh, you get that red color going from fall into the winter, but then it is going to change out a little bit. It's going to turn and you can see that slide over on the side where it begins to lose its color a little bit, but it still has that elegance to it, that flow, that airiness. I can tell by um, the picture that I took here, this was definitely taken in January because if that stockade fencing is running up the side, that is protection from one of the inaugurations, I believe Obama's second right after we planted this. Uh, so this is January eight years ago, but that's how that grass looked at that point. And we can even look at color again. So the Mullenbergia, the straight species we looked at has that pink tone, that pink mooly grass. Uh, cultivar on the side here that we planted in front of the Freer Museum because we didn't want that pink color. We wanted that light white and airy color going through the full season. So this is white cloud was the selection that we had over there. Uh, there's also carex and sedges that we can use in. So we'll mix some of these in sometimes permanently or use them as an annual choice. Uh, just one sedge that I pulled out here was this New Zealand sedge. I really love the orange color. You can see the design that it adds into that little annual area by the entrance of the museum. So many grasses, can't get into everything. So you, what you really need to do is go out to your garden, look at the elements the grasses are adding, or look at the element that you want to add back into your garden. So we have clary blue stems, little blue stem on the side here that has these little puffs, very narrow coming up, uh, could get some height to it. And then our Japanese forest grass, which gets a brilliant gold color arching branches, low ground cover, so sort of fills in a space quite nicely, um, both with the seed heads and with the foliage that continues to show. And I do believe it. I love grasses. I love seed heads. So back when I was decorating trees in my old job, I would cut them. I would bring them inside to enjoy them. I added them to this tree here that I wanted to have a holiday tree with gold colors. So there's a gorgeous allium blossom exploding in there, the grass is pouring out, some sticks coming through. Bring these elements in, they're wonderful, they really light up an area, uh, just love them. And moving on to, I believe, seed heads now, as I said, is in that design. So looking, once again, we progress from flowers to seed heads, that life cycle, we want to enjoy that life cycle, we want to enjoy the movement into winter. We want to see the poetic um, change. I'm really going to sell it hard. It's, it's going to be poetic. It's going to be gorgeous. So something here uh, where a lot of us are growing the milkweed specifically to feed our monarch butterflies. You see the pod that forms after covered in those milkweed beetles, and then it dries out. It slowly begins to split. And then in that side picture there, you can see those individual little seeds just beginning to lift off with their puff. So it's a place where you gotta go in, you gotta experience it, you gotta enjoy these little pieces. And then that seed's gonna float away and then we're gonna spread more milkweed through all of DC and create a wonderful habitat for our monarchs throughout the city here. Uh, once again, we're mostly enjoying the flowers on these plants. So here's the common uh, butterfly weed, those orange flowers that we get in the summertime, um, the foliage that's important, but you do get a gorgeous seed head and that movement to it, that changing and that element that brings it in. So every picture in this presentation I took, I experienced this all, I've seen all these plants, I love them and enjoy them and it's just getting out into the garden all the time and finding that joy in a winter scene. 
once again, the full cycle of a life plant, how, of a plant, how are they going to benefit you throughout the season? How are they going to benefit wildlife? So our native sienna, uh, wild sienna, sienna marilandica, uh, gets these yellow pea-like flowers down in the lower left-hand corner. It's also a food source, like the monarch caterpillar goes to the um, Asclepias that we just talked about. It's sulfur butterflies. Our, the sienna is a host plant for that. Um, and then being in that pea family, it gets these dry seed heads. So the far image with the yellow flower shows how they would mix into a fall meadow. And then in winter, um, just standing alone against a blue sky and in that black color can add an element. I have cut these. I have added them to flower arrangements that I've done in this dried um, dark color. And it's a unique element, it's a unique texture, and there definitely is a beauty to me um, in them. So looking at how plants change, looking at the movement to them, looking at the beauty that we get from it. So Baptisia australis, our false blue indigo, is once again, you can get those little pea-like uh, flowers on it earlier in the summer, late spring and then it turns into these little seed rattles. So it may blow in the wind and rattle a little bit. Children can pick it, shake it. Um, just a cool little stick with bubbles on it hanging out in our winter garden. Uh, it's not exclusively for perennials, so often we wanna leave the perennials around, keep them for cover. The annuals too. Uh, so here is our Mexican sunflower, Tithonia great pollinator plant, so drawing in the monarch butterfly that's getting the nectar from it now, and then those dried seed heads, an element that I want to keep around both for birds for a food source and just for an interesting element. If I cut it out, I just have nothing in the garden, so might as well have something to look at, something that's going to catch the snow, catch the light, and give me some color. Um, and as I just mentioned too, we want to feed back, we want to feed back into wildlife by feeding them. So here we have a cone flower. We want to see this progression. We want to see the flower bloom be wonderful for pollinators, lose its petals, turn into a cone, and then see the goldfinches all come in. We are actually getting flocks of goldfinches in DC. Super excited to see that because we're adding the right environment to it. So perfectly happy to see that cone then eaten away and none of the seeds remaining, and you just have this little stick coming up. Uh, potential to catch the snow, so light, snow, they're all going to add an additional element, uh, additional fun time to go out and take pictures, to walk around, to enjoy what's going on. Uh, one of my favorite snow pictures I've taken is these seed heads of Queen Anne's lace that just caught these perfect snowballs. The snow was the right consistency that it just stacked on, and it almost looks like a flower in itself, but just a really fun view on what can happen when you leave these elements in the garden. Uh, full life cycles, again, talking about that. So Minarda, something that we're not going to think about as a winter plant, but those seed heads are going to dry out. They're going to be fairly dense, and then we get into the season where some water, uh, snow may catch on top of it, too. Great gold color, in my opinion, as well. So think about the different plants you have in the garden and what are they gonna look like during the winter season? Uh, great flowers like, um, what do we have here? Our um, hibiscus may not have that showy of a flower bud, but they're all things that we can enjoy. Uh, once again, just a sampling uh, to show you if you're not paying attention to what your seeds look like. So we have goldenrod, we have ironweed, the clematis there that we saw in a couple other shots, um, and St. John's wort. So all different textures, all different colors, all different elements that are adding into your garden in the winter for a pairing. And even when those seeds blow away, so here's eupatorium, the dried stems can even look ornamental, especially against the right sky. Um, and talking about stems, we'll move on to bark and stems. Uh, 
one of my favorite things. I love trees. I love bark. There's a lot of interesting textures. You should be looking at them and enjoying them in all seasons, but the winter is really the time where they get to be a highlight on their own. Uh, so a sampling of some of the things that we have in the gardens here and just the different type of textures if you're not cued into the textures, the feels, and the color of bark. So the prickly ash adds a really interesting element in our garden with these thorns that come out of it, the fringe tree, the peeling back of that brown bark, the little lines that are created by the white gray lenticels that are on it, uh, beautiful element. Something even as common as our white oak here, that plated mottled bark, looking where there's certain places the branches disappeared. There's going to be insects hiding under those pallets overwintering, so that's important for wildlife as a whole, but it's also a great backdrop for us to enjoy. Uh, the Parisian parodia down in the lower corner there, cool patchiness, the evolution of that bark as it ages and changes along is quite the fun thing to watch. Just sit around, stare at your trunks, watch the bark in the winter, see what happens, see how they look. Uh, certain elements, so back to our pollinator garden here, uh, the river birch, this great peeling, this mottled bark, uh, once again, doing some stylistic things. I've used samples of this. I've made a wreath that I hang inside for winter, uh, but the elements of it, it's great once again as habitat where insects, moss, or things like that might be under there hiding for the winter, but really pops in that landscape as you see in the top corner. It's not gonna be something that's showy through, it is showy through the full year, but it's gonna be recognized during the time where it doesn't have the competition of other things going on in the garden. Uh, I am a New Englander. Being down here in DC is the deep south to me. I will um, give a little bit of sympathy to the other people in the north as we move on to the segments to talk about flowers and annuals because I know it's not something I grew up with but I love the landscape I grew up with. I love the winters that we have up there. And I tried to bring a little bit down to DC. So we mostly see river barches here. Uh, I had paper bark birches in my yard growing up, that beautiful white foliage. And to bring it into DC, chose a cultivar called Renaissance Reflection, which has a heat tolerance to it, which has been surviving well in the city. If you try to bring the straight species in around here in our more southern warm environment. It's not really the tree that's going to survive well for you, but the selection does well with heat tolerance. Uh, Acer grissium, just wanted to show because I really enjoy this picture of the peeling bark that I took on the side, the flow to it. I told you I'm going to sell you hard on this. These brown elements, the younger bark coming out from the older, more plated, the way it glows in the sunlight when it comes across, just such elegance into the garden to, in our winter season. Even our saucer magnolias in the health garden, the thing that is the talk of the town in horticulture in the spring when these alleys are in bloom, that great bark uh, gray like an elephant trunk just lights up in the winter, shows a nice element, and these trees also give the special feature of having these little fuzzy buds that are forming right now for next spring's flowers that I like to think of as little holiday lights um, in the trees there. They're perfectly shaped as them. The little fuzziness catches the light right and it will just light up the tree and show it off with this great gray bark. Um, think about how we're going to use the different barks, how there's so many options available to us. So just within maple here, here's three different maples. You can look at the coral bark maple, that beautiful bright red uh, twigs going on it, a snake bark maple, smooth stem, not bright colors, but that cool, cool bark to it that, um, I mean, snake bark, it gets a name from it. It has 
that great texture, those cool colors running through it that just can really show off in that winter season. And then moving on, like I said, to the Acer palmatum, that thread leaf that the branching habit is the show stealer there. So when those leaves fall away, the way that you're going to be able to enjoy a well pruned maple is something that's of great value in the winter. Uh, moving down from trees to some shrubs, there is tons of options in our twig dogwoods. Uh, this is a red twig dogwood that has um, caught some ice from an ice storm we had. Very well backed up with this uh, broadleaf evergreen, so popping in the landscape. James, I hate to interrupt, but your sound just went out completely. If we could do something to get it, yeah, move closer, that'd be great. Thank you. Can you hear me again? Nope. <laughs> How about now? It's still, it's still low. People are gonna have to turn up. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, check your connection to your computer. Okay, now try. Any better? Nope. Oh, that's on. Oh, there, that is. I don't know what you just did, but you just made it better. So okay. stay in that exact position. Yeah, and now my face will be closer to the screen. That's great. We like looking at you with the slides. Thanks. So, as I said, here we have that beautiful red twig dogwood presented so great among the evergreens. Back to the presentation flip here, but they do come in different colors. So, uh, two different varieties of yellow twig dogwood, the Taltarian dogwood, Bud's Yellow. So, this is a landscape that was installed at the Natural History Museum. Has that gorgeous uh, bronzy gold rotunda, uh, the nice um, tyran not Tyrannosaurus Rex, um, the other dinosaur the Triceratops head right there. So we wanted to select our plants that paired better with the cap of our rotunda, uh, rotunda that paired better with our live cast of a dinosaur skull. So we chose a yellow. I don't think red would be as appropriate here. The yellow really makes those options pop. So in your own home, think about how your rotunda looks. Think about the sculptural elements, the historic dinosaur pieces that you have outside and how you wanna match your plants to those. Uh, then on the other side, you can see those yellow twigs popping up against that green backdrop. A lot of cool cultivars out here. This is one that I selected for the garden, Arctic Sun. It has a more um, golden bright color towards the center. And then as you move out on the twigs, it gets to that red coral and just a cool element. So even against the golden backdrop of the dried meadow planting that we have out there. It's really popping strongly. Um, I love these for cut arrangements too, to bring those fun outdoor elements inside, uh, but just a great element and one of my fa personal favorites. Uh, tons of natives in here. The silky dogwood, our native um, twig dogwood, great red sticks in it, gets very large. You're gonna want to, be taking care of these being pruning out um, about a third of the old growth every year. So it gives you a great opportunity to use these in ornamental elements. Uh, going back again to just the structure of a tree. So a Harry Waters locking stick, those fun contorted branches that are gonna add an amazing element to any garden. And they also get the catkins that hang down throughout the winter time um, that or late winter, early spring, that will add another element in for looks and appearance. Evergreens, uh, go out to your local botanic garden, see what's going on. So this is over the collection over at our National Arboretum. So you can see all the different kinds of colors, textures that are available out there. They're gonna be a great shelter source. So we wanna think about where our birds are gonna hide during the winter and a great nesting material for those that are overwintering with us and not escaping to Florida. Uh, here's, I'll give you a little evergreen sampler. Uh, you can see the different textures that you have here between the spruce, the juniper, the pine, the arborvitae, and the umbrella pine below. So, so many different elements 
from a similar group of plants as the conifers, but they're all going to have different shapes, different sizes, different colors, different purposes in your garden. So just because it's winter doesn't mean you shouldn't be planning. You want to think about how those elements are going to play out in your garden. And it doesn't mean that you can't have color either with evergreens. They're not all green. Uh, so you can see some blues on the side here, a selection of our native juniper, Juniperus virginiana gray owl, which once again has those great um, fruits on it, but also a great um, gray blue color to bring in as long as, as well as that blue star in the lower corner and uh, the false cypress on the other side bringing in that great gold color. So you can do that design, blues, golds, you don't have to have greens or anything else in the garden at that point. And it's not just needled evergreen, so once again, way too many to go into. Uh, there is also a blog posting that goes along with this presentation that expands on some of the different areas, and there is an expansion talking about our broadleaf um, evergreens that do well over winter. But once again, you're going to want to think about the life cycle on those. So here's the native Northwest um, Oregon grape holly, um, and the foliage actually changes color to this deep burgundy red in the winter, and you can see how it plays well against the snow in the large picture, uh, where other things will keep a green color going throughout, or maybe tone to a little bit darker brown. Flowers. There is the opportunity to bring flowers into the garden in winter. Um, this is like where I said, we have a little bit more down in our area here, and as you gain more towards the south, even more you can incorporate in. But at the time when we're starting to get into spring or late fall, any little bloom is something that we're going to enjoy. Our native witch hazel, Hamamelis virginiana, this is going to be the fall blooming. So just getting ready for us to bloom about now, born on the stems, an important source to have out for pollinators too in that late season. So if you go out, it's going to be, it was 80 degrees yesterday, you're going to see pollinators out and about, you're still going to see some pop out in November. They need some food sources when they're waking up and heading out in the winter on a warm day. Um, in addition to that fall blooming native, we have our spring blooming native, which is the Hamomelis vernalis, the Ozark witch hazel, and then there's a lot of great cultivars, Arnold's Promise, very popular, very fragrant, uh, hugely popular in the Ripley Garden in spring for its fragrance and beauty, uh, great hybrid. Uh, too many camellia species to name. Once again, you have fall and spring options for blooms. You could stylize it with your garden. You can get the pinks, you can get whites, there's reds in there, there's blush colors. Um, great evergreen foliage too, so even going back to that evergreen element, uh, camellias really do well for us in this area. If you're in DC, come to the Help Garden on the east side, up against the Arts and Industries building. Over about four years ago, five years ago, put in a great camellia garden. There's probably 30 different varieties in there that all have a different season of bloom and different looks. So come check it out, see the ones that you like. On the other side there in the Ripley Garden, we have this gorgeous Edgeworthia that blooms January, maybe February, depends on how quickly we get to warmth. The flowers come out before the foliage, so a great show. That yellow color also pops really well against the red brick, uh, so it's really well positioned in the garden up against the Arts and Industries building. Uh, as you can see, hellebores, they will come out in the snow. That one's surrounded by a snow right there. A lot of new breeding and hellebores going on, tons of different varieties. Um, so check out the different colors. I'm seeing them used as sort of annual interior plants at Trader Joe's. Buy the plant now, enjoy it, or in the spring, enjoy it in the in your house and then move it out into your garden and uh, enjoy it next spring. And we can't forget about bulbs. Uh, what I did, I think I have 27,000 pictures on my cell phone right now. 
I looked up what flowers I was seeing in January, February here in the spring. Um, and these were the ones that kept popping up in my feed, which are the Gallianthus, snowdrops, uh, certain daffodils. Once again, it's all in the timing and taking the particular cultivars. So this one is February gold. And I can pretty much go back to every year because I take a picture of this one flower because it's the first daffodil I see in the Ripley garden blooming every year, hitting us about January, February. Um, and then uh, lots of great crocuses, once again, colors and designs that you can work with on those. Uh, I wanted to feature this plant especially. It's becoming the new favorite of mine. Everybody's doing crocus, everybody has snowdrops. I don't think enough people are using uh, the reticulated iris, iris reticulata, um, about the scale of a crocus, a little bit larger than that, coming out about the same time of year, but just these beautiful iris blooms on it tons of, not tons, but many different cultivars so you can see the different color samplings that we have about there. Uh, the bloom will force up in early, early spring, late winter. Um, and then when it disappears, the foliage does begin to force a little bit more. Uh, just a few whip-like leaves that you can see there that you'll have to keep around for a little bit and then completely disappears well before the late, um, the summer garden comes in. So all in all, if it was just dead twigs, I would be a happy gardener. But sometimes we want to add that little extra emphasis, the few annual plants just to jazz it up. So here's a bench in the pollinator garden. I think this view is fine, but you can see in the lower left-hand corner, and if we turn around there, we did add annual elements, some grasses, some kale, some pansies, and stuff like that. Uh, as I said, I'm a New Englander. I came down to this region. I studied two years at Longwood, then moved from Delaware to Virginia to work at the American Horticulture Society for three years, and now 10 years at Smithsonian Gardens. When I first arrived here, I said, okay, you can plant these plants in the fall, but they're not going to be here in the spring. Uh, for us in DC, these are the plants that are going to be here in the spring that uh, we use your tax dollars well here at Smithsonian Gardens. We do two annual plantings a year. Our October plants are these selections, kale, dusty miller, kohlrabis, cabbages, parsley, pansies. We had a truck come in today. We're planting all these from our greenhouse right now in October, and they will be here all the way till March. Um, up in the north, where I am from, you're going to plant some and they may disappear and then you're going to have to replant in the spring. But it all depends on how harsh the winter conditions are or maybe you want to plant them in a cold frame. You want to think about that life cycle. So here we have the kale planted in the garden. Uh, you can see the upper left hand corner has a pumpkin that was planted in fall. Uh, moving over to the next screen. Uh, the fencing's up against the side, which tells me I took this picture in January, um, and the kale's looking good then. The lower corner, you can see it sort of getting hit by that frost a little bit. It's looking a little bit sadder. And then um, we keep ours around, so it goes into bloom, that lower corner. Uh, you'll see the blossoms on it, great for pollinators. We have a lot of tourists that come into our garden and ask us what the flower we planted is in spring because we let our kales go into bloom and they enjoy that appearance and that look in the garden so much. Uh, like I said, these are plants that are going to survive through the winter in some places, die in others. Uh, choosing ones that are more cold hardy in the pansy world, the smaller violas uh, last a little bit better here than some of those large blooming varieties. They can get the frost, as you see in the side, and bounce back to good for us. Um, they may also sort of die back down to their base a little bit and reflush at times. Uh, one of the plants I want to feature because it wasn't something that I was using and now I see a ton of our gardeners using becoming more, one of our more popular plants here used in the parterre and other areas are wall, wallflowers which 
a lot of great color selections. Something that when our staff first started using them a lot uh, back a few years ago, I said that flower doesn't look like something that's going to survive. And it has been doing very, very well for us in the winter. So we've been enjoying those. You can see it has snow on it and then bounces back for a strong uh, spring display. Uh, we're gonna end up here. I know I'm running closer to the end for questions uh, and we will follow up with those questions later too. Just wanna give a quick plug. As you move into the winter, you're also gonna be wanting looking at your gardening books. Smithsonian Gardens came out with their first gardening book a few years ago, the Encyclopedia of Garden Plants for Every Location. I was the editor for that book. It talks about um, within its 400 pages, this lower block you can see there, planting for seasonal interest is a specific section for it. So if you wanna learn even more, you can look at the seasonal content pages, has recipes um, in the book for seasonal effect, um, different plant seasonal interest, and the sort of things that we talked about today and there even expanded on a little bit more fall and winter flowers for containers, uh, different types of evergreen effects, ornamental fruits, uh, the shape and texture of leaves, of stems. So all these great topics um, in an even greater depth um, that you can go and check out at your leisure. And there we are. Oh, I'm tired. I feel like I've been all over the gardens and back. Thank you, James. That was terrific. Uh, just you, somebody wants to buy the book already. So I know you can buy it on the... Uh, Smithsonian Enterprise website. So that's something that you can get it or you're looking or think, or just Google it. It's going to pop up. I can't say the name, but it's going to pop up when you Google it. Uh, um, book retailers. Yes, book retailers. That's a good way to be able to put it. First. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And we do apologize for the sound. Uh, James has a, a wonky connection to his computer. So it, it, I'm glad most people were able to hear, but we're going to put uh, the presentation up online so you'll be able to see it and will be closed captioned at that point in case you missed any points at all, which I don't think they did. Everyone's uh, 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 appreciating your enthusiasm and I think you've sold many, many people on the beauty of winter gardens. You just have to get outside and look or plant it right outside your window. But we have only five minutes left and I wanted to, one of the most important questions people were asking uh, because I do the same thing. I leave my perennials up over the winter for the most part. Uh, does this encourage diseases to uh, formulate on the leaves or what's your opinion on leaving the things up? What should we leave up and what should we cut down? I mean, you get into that situation where you have both benefits and it can have some negative um, detractions to it as well too. Uh, but I try to leave as much material as I can. Uh, you want that leaf litter on the ground. It's going to be a place for insects to overwinter. What we want to do is create a happy, balanced ecosystem. And those leaves are naturally breaking down, getting that new, fresh material into the ground. So I wouldn't stack, I wouldn't want eight, 10 inches of leaves. So sometimes when I have a pathway, I'll actually uh, compost those instead of putting them back on the bed because I don't want to get it too inorganically thick. Um, the other thing I'll say is maybe I'm a little obsessive compulsive at times too, but I'll go out and I'll prune my dead plant. So I want everything, <laughs> all the flower, dead flower stalks upright and straight mm -hmm. and one's going off to the side. So I have been known to like go in and prune uh, past iron weed or something like that, just so it looks the most pretty to me, knowing that they're all gonna come out eventually. Right, and, and I must say, I do cut things out that are diseased. I get peonies with powdery mildew and I take those out at the end of the year. So I'm not gonna leave that leaf litter, but there's so many perennials that do much better if you overwinter them with the stems up because then they don't rot uh, uh, for the crown as much and they provide habitat for insects to be able to live in the stems. And things like uh, semi-shrubs like lavender, uh, germander, and rosemary, it's very important to leave up in the winter time. Otherwise, you might not have a lavender next year. And I'll add too, certainly if you're knowledgeable that there is a disease 
in your area, then you would want to remove that plant material and not keep it around. So my friends are always sending me plant pictures, whether it's from them or their mm -hmm. parents. So I got a powdery mildew on magnolia pitcher just this past weekend. And so when that family rakes up their leaves, it's best for them to bag it and take it away because we know that disease is in there and it will be better to remove it um, rather than keep it around. Excellent, exactly. Um, one question that you can answer right now is, what was the plant that was the first uh, shrub or tree that you showed with the fruit on it? I think you said it was aronia. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the picture was repeated in the slide, so it had the label on it then with the little snow sitting on it. I yeah. think we used that as our Smithsonian Gardens holiday card. Uh, I think that, yes, we did. We did use it as a card. I'm a special letter. friend of us. Yes. Our. Yes. So thank you so much. We, oh, I do have a chance for one more. How long are the fruits going to last on these plants, especially the beauty berry? You mentioned the astringency of the choke cherry, uh, making it less palatable early on so it stays on. How about the other ones you mentioned? You know, it really has to do with the year for me, too, is that I have seen it where they go quick. Uh, I don't know if there wasn't a new food source around. And that was around the first time I planted those, the first season that they had really set good fruits. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to get to enjoy these for a long time. And now I notice that they are sticking around. And I have two of them planted, the Smithsonian Gardens, very large piece of land here on the National Mall. There's one in one area and one a block away that there's about a month difference between when they get eaten by the birds. So it's hard to say sometimes. We know the aronia is going to stick around because it needs that cold treatment. And then the less it's going to be a popularity contest dependent on birds and what other food sources you're supplying them. Yeah, that's true. So gardeners are ever hopeful plant and hope that it will last a while. If not, feel grateful that the birds are eating well. It's so a good thing for them. It is eat. a good thing. Exactly. So next week, this was just to get you in the mood to be shivering, but we know that you need to start getting ready for winter. So our next pro our program next week is going to be about bringing your tropicals inside, which we should think about doing very soon in the Mid-Atlantic and really soon if you're in the Northwest. Uh, northwest or northeast um, is when we really want to bring them in. So yeah, look forward to see you next Chicago, week. Maybe. <laughs> maybe Chicago. Yeah, I have, yeah. So come and join us next week. We'll have some more great information for you. I thank you for joining us today. And thank you, James, for your terrific presentation. Always, thank always. You all for joining. Okay. See you later. Bye bye.